Uh, my name is Neil Thomas. I come from a lot of disciplines, but I worked in Mimi Cole's lab in the Department of Integrative Biology, and I'll be talking today about marine larvae and turbulence. So before we ask what is turbulence, we should think about where turbulence is. Maybe you've been on an airplane and the pilot has come on the intercom and says, we're going to be experiencing a little bit of turbulence, and we're going to experience a little bit of turbulence today, but we're not going to be afraid of it because turbulence is everywhere. Um, it, you can see it in the plume of smoke above a cigarette. It's in the air, in the lungs, in your lungs that you're breathing right now. You can see it in a raging river, in the wake of a grounded ship. And our intuition has already told us what turbulence is, in a sense. You heard Aaron mention it er earlier. But you can see a smooth flow initially, which is what we call laminar flow, which transitions into turbulence, which is a sort of random, chaotic, more difficult flow. Um, turbulence is an energetic flow, and what puts energy into a fluid system? Um, some examples are wind, gravity. And what this does is an initial large, large scale input of energy starts to break up into these random, random eddies, these random features in the flow. So these little swirls, which start to break up using inertial forces, so they hit each other, they start to fragment and become smaller and smaller until eventually the internal frictional forces and viscosity of the fluid dissipates these eddies into heat. So this is summarized very neatly in the poem. Big worlds have little worlds that feed on their velocity, and little worlds have lesser worlds, and so on to viscosity. So what does this look like in the ocean, which is what we're interested in? Well, this is data taken from a wave tank in the lab with a surface meant to mimic the surface of a coral reef. And if you look above this four centimeter mark, the flow is pretty regular. You have just a back and forth movement. Each of the arrows represents the velocity of the fluid at that point. But if you start getting nearer to the surface, you start seeing these little features, these swirls, these eddies. We can call it turbulence for now. Um, it's more technical than that. But so the surface actually starts to cause these features in the flow. And we're interested in how organisms navigate an environment with chaotic, chaotic flow. So who are, these, who are these organisms that live in the bottom of the ocean? Um, you may, might have seen a starfish, might have seen a sea slug, but you probably haven't seen their younger forms, their larval forms, which are much smaller than them, about 100 microns, 500, so, yeah, micrometers. Um, and these are shot up into the ocean and are carried by the currents and eventually have to find a suitable site to land, settle, and then develop into their larger forms. So they're being tossed around by these waves, and they're an interesting case study because their navigation of that turbulent flow is essential for their survival as a species. And it's important to note that just because they're small doesn't mean they can't do anything. Um, this is a sea slug larva that we were using in our experiments. And you can see when he runs into his friend, he sort of pulls in his swimming structures, to his cil cilia structures, and that particular response is important because while swimming, larvae tend to have a mean upward velocity, but when they are not swimming, they can sink. And so they can basically decide, they can increase their probability of actually hitting the bottom when the currents are tossing them around. So in terms of the broader interest in this, in this research, if we can understand larval, uh, larval patterns, larval ecology, we can work on preserving natural environments, preventing settlement uh, settlement on sites that we're not interested in having them, like uh, dock harbors or ship hulls, and we can engineer artificial forms of natural environments. So what is it actually like for a small 100 mic micrometer larva to exist in the water? It's very different than what it's like for you or me. So we talked about the turbulence of the flow, and using the viscosity of the fluid, you can calculate what the smallest eddy possible is before the viscosity dissipates those eddies into heat. And what we find is that larvae are actually smaller than the scale of the smallest eddy. So if you're standing in a rushing river, you can feel swirls sort of coming by your feet. You can see, you can see features in the flow. But for larvae, the world is very different. All you can feel are these sort of differences in velocities around your body um, or acceleration. So, you can get crushed, you can get rotated maybe slightly, but you don't really know what's going on around you. Um, so previous experiments have already cemented the importance of turbulence in larval ecology. Um, in particular, they, they did a study where they put a bunch of larvae in a tank that looks like this, 
which sort of stirs it up, and then they test how many larvae actually settle. And what they found is that the more turbulent the flow, the more settlement. So that means that larvae are using the turbulence as cues for settlement. But we're interested in what, preci what precise portion of turbulence is causing this response, because turbulence is very random. Very, there's all of these eddies at all of these length scales. So what exactly is it that the larvae are responding to? Is it a rotation? Is it a, a crushing force? Is it a shearing force where they're being pulled in two directions at once? And so what we decided, in order to test this hypothesis, we wanted to, or to test this question, we wanted to build a hydrodynamic trap. Um, which is a trap that operates with fluid. And the, base, the basic schematic structure of this is you have two inlet, flow, inlet pipes that meet at a cross with two outlet pipes. So you have sort of, a, um, yeah, you have water coming in to the center and then flowing out these two, the two vertical crosses. Um, and the flow, the streamlines are pictured above. And at the very center, there's a velocity node where the two inlet pipes, two in, the water from the two inlet pipes have hit each other and cancel out each other's momentum. So if you just put a particle or a larva in this, in this hydrodynamic trap, it'll flow along an inlet pipe and then follow one of these streamlines and flow right out of the other pipe. But what's cool about the trap is you can actually adjust the, the relative resistances of the two outlets by constricting the actual pipes. And thus change the flow, control your particle, move it along a new streamline, and then restore it to the area that you're interested in studying. So the advantages that the hydrodynamic trap brings is you can subject your, your larva to time-dependent flow fields. So you heard earlier Aaron talking about still flow fields. These are going to be more time-dependent. Um, and in addition, we can trap an actual individual for a long period of time, which is important because in biology there is large variation over individuals. So this has been done before at the micro scale um, with microfluidic devices. But the problem is that these are far too small. 400 micrometers is about twice the size of the larva we're interested in. So we needed to build this at a larger scale. Oh, I forgot to bring my actual device. I will get it. So I want to show you what the actual device looks like. Just give you an idea. I brought, brought one of the, the devices that I built this summer in. And so this. A little bit about the fabrication, it was uh, laser cut out of acrylic. The channels were laser cut out of acrylic. Two microscope slides sandwiched the actual channels. Um, and then these needle tips were put on the edges in order to hook it up to a larger fluid flow system. Um, so this is, this is the, uh, the experimental setup, or at least it was in the lab um, before it got taken to Hawaii. You can see the inlet reservoir here, the two outlet reservoirs here. And right here, uh, this is the device is underneath the microscope. You put a camera on top and film the larva. And right here is our actual control mechanism, which is a three-way switch valve. And the way it operates is by when you rotate, when you rotate that controller here, you basically align or disalign the, the, the outlet pipe. So a small rotation can cause a constricting in the outlet. So that allows us to update the resistance. And this is ash, this is video taken in Hawaii of one of these bastilla, the sea slug larva, in our device. So you're looking at the very center of the device. Um, this is a 15 second video, it repeats. And what's happening is we're basically aligning and disaligning um, the, 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 the switch valve. And what's that, what that's doing is changing the relative resistances of the outlets and shaking the larva. So we're subjecting him to this linear acceleration. What's interesting is if you look right here, he pulls in his swimming structures and actually responds to, well, we hypothesize that he's responding to, to the, imp, the inputs that we're giving him. So look again, boom, he turns into a nice little sphere, and then extends again. Um, so preliminarily, uh, we, have, we have some results where we take the larva that do respond and look for some sort of signal um, right before the response. And what we see is a pretty clear maximum of linear acceleration that the larva are exposed to pre uh, preceding a response. And we also have some idea of the actual time that it takes to respond to an impulse. Um, that's going to be about a tenth of a second. So there's a lot more work that needs to be done with this. Um, in particular, the device itself can be improved uh, with a more precise control mechanism. 
And with a more precise control mechanism, instead of trapping it along the line we were shaking it, we could potentially actually trap it at the very center, the velocity node, turn up the, crank up the volume on him, and then subject it to an extensional force, which would basically stretch him instead of shake him along that same line. Um, in addition, the same fabrication technique uh, potentially could be used to scale up all kinds of microfluidic devices for in, uh, interesting biophysical millimeter scale application. And we're uh, start, starting to work on a prototype of a vortex creating device um, that looks sort of like this and is around the same size um, for use with smaller and smaller animals. So uh, thank you very much for listening. I'd like to acknowledge everyone who made this work possible and happy to take any questions.